on this week in Iowa, one day before the start of the legislative session, we talked to leadership from the Iowa House, Speaker of the House Pat Grassley and Minority Leader Jennifer Confers. From priorities to controversies that might arise, what you can expect under the Golden Dome. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for being with us on This Week in Iowa, the day before the start of the legislative session. I'm Sabrina Ahmed. The year, the second year of the 89th General Assembly begins Monday. That's the 2022 legislative session. Republicans still have control of both chambers and will decide the agenda. Before the holiday, we heard from leaders in the Iowa Senate, the Republican Majority Leader Jack Whitver and Democratic Minority Leader Zach Walls. Today we hear from the House and the priorities both parties have this legislative session. So we begin with Speaker of the House, Pat Grassley. He's a Republican uh, and this is his fourth year as Speaker. Take a listen to what he says are the biggest issues he and his caucus want to tackle this session. A lot of the conversation that's going on right now in the state, and I don't think it's just a, an Iowa specific thing, is the economy. You know, you're looking at the higher inflation, some record levels of inflation over the last several decades. And so as a state, we've been very fortunate with the leadership of Governor Reynolds to keep Iowa open. Our economy is extremely strong. So I think you're going to see a lot of conversations around workforce, you know, making sure we continue to be sound in our budget, and more importantly, returning uh, the over a billion dollars that we have in our taxpayer relief fund back to Iowans. We want to make sure that we can step up and do our part as a state because we are in such a strong fiscal position and we know Iowans are facing uh, a lot of pressures from what I would say a lot of decisions that the president has made at the federal level. And so if we can step up as a state and we've got the resources, we need to make sure we're returning those dollars back into the uh, uh, hands of Iowans and getting that back in the economy. How do you do that? Uh, I think the first thing that has to be looked at is, you know, like I said, we've got our most recent December revenue estimate. Um, we're looking at, uh, again, a over a billion dollars that was collected on top of all of the reserves that we have. So this billion dollars that everyone keeps talking about, the fund was created. So if there was an overpayment of tax dollars, it was created to go back to the taxpayer. So we're in a position where what does the bill look like? It's probably a little bit too early to tell you what the exact bill would look like, but I think we really don't want to be in a position where we're picking winners and losers. I think that's going to be extremely important and coming up with a tax plan that's simple and easy to understand. You see so many conversations around legislation that I don't think average Iowans, uh, ha you know, it's, it's just there's so many moving pieces. I would like for us to come up with something that's fairly easy and uh, to understand by Iowans and for legislators to explain to their constituents. As we continue to see this rise in COVID cases once again, and people are going to be inside all winter, it's going to start to get cold again. Um, what do you think is the answer for vaccinations as far as, you know, when we're looking at hospital numbers, the far uh, majority of people who are severely ill from COVID are not vaccinated. Yeah, and I think you're continuing to see, you know, uh, you're, you're seeing decisions being made at the legislature to still leave that decision up to Iowans, but do everything we can to encourage, you know, obviously uh, social distancing. I think a lot of the practice with just in sanitation, you're seeing whether it's in your schools or in any departments or anywhere that you would go. So you're seeing those things naturally happen. And I think that um, what I'm hearing, and again, this is what we hear when we go back home, is Iowans want to be able to continue to have their kids in school. We made that decision last session to vote to require that schools had to offer in-person learning. Iowans want to continue to have as much sense of normalcy in their lives as possible, but I think you're, you know, they really are recognizing that there's precautions that they have to take, and I think we see those happening, whether it's in public or private settings. I'd like to talk a little bit more about education. There's a huge teacher shortage. Mm -hmm. um, schools were actually closing because they just don't have the staff. Forget about COVID. Yeah. Um, what do you think can be done? Teachers are saying they need higher wages. Yeah. Well, like I said, we're, we're fun, putting more money into, the state is putting more money into education right now than we ever have under control under any party. One of the things that I always touch on is whatever commitment we've made as House Republicans, we've always followed through with that number and it sticks. We don't make any cuts. It's been 10 years uh, since Governor Culver, over 10 years since Governor Culver where there was a cut to education. So we've been upholding our commitments. I would also say uh, from the standpoint of workforce and the shortage, I. I don't talk to an employer at any level, like I said, whether it's uh, uh, healthcare, uh, teaching, uh, manufacturing, any of that. Workforce is the driving issue. And I think, 
you know, like I talked about taxes earlier, that's a part of that conversation. I think you're gonna see as the governor continues to uh, roll out parts of her agenda, you're gonna see more and more conversation about workforce, not just in one specific industry. It's a statewide uh, problem that we're seeing all over. So beyond taxes, what can legislate? Well, I think, you know, childcare has been a big thing at House Republicans. I think we've passed approximately eight to 10 bills in the last several years trying to address that. We're, we've seen quite a few of those make it to the governor's desk. There's maybe some more that we need to do to have make sure employers are partnering with maybe um, uh, providers within their community or maybe providing more child care on site or working with someone to provide that. So there's further incentives that we can provide. So I'd say child care, uh, obviously a competitive tax. I mean, I've touched on that probably enough at this point, but um, and housing has been a big, you know, not just in, you know, we always think that uh, just in urban Iowa, that that's the only place where there's a housing shortage. It's all across the state and anything that we can do, we've already started down that path last year to make sure we can increase the incentives for folks that want to uh, continue to build that affordable housing. Coming up on This Week in Iowa, I sit down with the House Minority Leader, Jennifer Confers, for plans for the upcoming session next. Representative Jennifer Confer's first full session as the House Minority Leader. She was elected last year when Todd Pritchard announced he was stepping down. Take a listen to what she has planned for Democrats this session and how they can continue to be effective in the minority. Our priorities continue to be we want to make sure that the Iowans who keep this economy running, who keep Iowa moving, are the ones who are benefiting from any sort of um, policies that impact their economy, their taxes, etc. We know that Iowa's middle class is the heartbeat of this state, and we want to make sure that they are truly represented and getting, um, and that policy decisions are being made in their, in their, with their interests in mind. It's really important to us that they don't get left behind. I just had a chat with Senator Whitmer not too long ago. Um, one of his priorities will be tax reform yes. and continuing to um, cut taxes. Yep. How do you feel about that? Look, I mean, I think that there are the devil's in the details with all of these plans. They're really easy slogans to make when it comes to tax reform, but actually putting those policies into action has real consequences and real impact. We want to make sure that whatever tax reform takes place in the state of Iowa goes directly to the middle class. It's we're past the time when super wealthy folks and special interests get to get the benefit of all these tax cuts. We've seen they've tried that a lot. It hasn't worked. Now is the time to actually bring in the middle class, the people who keep this economy moving, who will reinvest that money in our state, in our economy, give them the benefit of some tax reform if we're going to do that. We, of course, have been uh, living in this pandemic for almost two years. Um, it's exhausting. People are tired. Iowans are tired. They're tired of talking about it. They're tired of hearing about it, but it's not gone. It's still here. It's still very much here. Um, what do you think needs to be legislatively done or can be legislatively done to help continue to move Iowa forward out of the pandemic? I think it's a really important point you raise that Iowans are tired of the pandemic. I am too. I would prefer not to have to have these conversations anymore. We all would, but that's not the reality we live in. We need to still be vigilant. We need to still make sure that we're looking for ways to get Iowa out of this pandemic, to get back on the road to recovery. And I think legislatively, the things we need to do are focus on things that are addressing and helping our small businesses. You know, House Democrats introduced legislation last year that would have expanded loans for small businesses who are still trying to get on their feet, that would have helped um, working Iowans make sure that they can afford to put food on the table. That kind of legislation still needs to be done. We need to address the people who are affected by the pandemic and the business and the community members who have been affected so strongly and see if we can't find ways to help them. That brings me to the workforce yeah. issue that our state is uh, facing. It's not just, you know, it's every sector needs workers. Not to be left behind is the teacher shortage. Um, it's a huge issue and it's going, it, it was an issue before the pandemic began and it's so much worse now. What can be done? I think we have to remember that Iowa's workforce crisis, which is what it is, um, affects all of us in one way or another. It might be that we can't get into our favorite restaurant or that our favorite shop is closed um, because they can't find workers, or it might be that our school has long-term subs because they can't get teachers, or it might be that we don't feel like we have the colleagues that are 
um, here for the long haul with us, right? It's affecting all of us. And we need to realize that it's a bigger problem than just a quick fix and a quick solution, but we don't have any time to wait. We have to start addressing this workforce crisis on many levels. We have to make sure that we're making Iowa a welcoming state. What does our brand look like around the country? Do people look at Iowa and say, that looks like a place I wanna to go to live? Or do they hear stories about divisive bills, sort of extreme legislation that's getting passed and think, that's not the place that values me. We need to make sure that what we're doing at the legislature reflects that we want everyone to come to this state. We need to look at our um, immigration policy and make sure that people feel welcome here so that they can do work. We need to look at wages. We need to make sure that we're looking at good schools, quality public education that's been invested in. People are gonna move their family to the state of Iowa. They wanna know their public school is as strong as possible. So I don't think there's a quick fix to this problem but we also need to start attacking it from every angle because we don't have any time to waste. We continue our chat with Republicans in the House and the Senate as well. Con controversial topics with Pat Grassley, where he sees them going this session. We continue our discussion with Speaker Grassley this morning and move on to some of the more controversial topics we've heard might come up this session. Take a listen. Another thing about education, we've seen a lot about um, conversation about um, parental rights mm -hmm. through uh, all of this. Now there's been conversation of whether it should be illegal for a teacher to possess or distribute a book. Um, where do you lie in that? Well, I would say first, I think our caucus has been extremely clear. Any opportunity we have to allow, or not necessarily allow, I mean, I think obviously the parents have that, but you're seeing all over the state, not only through our elections here at the legislative level, but also at the local elections on school boards, is making sure that parents have a voice. The number one, whenever I'm asked about this, if somebody said kind of, you know, what's your philosophy on this bill or that stuff, I think the first thing we have to look at is where do the parents have a seat at the table in this? And I think you're seeing more and more engagement at the local level by parents with school boards and school groups, uh, making sure that they're having their voices heard. You know, quite frankly, should the legislature be going in and saying this book, this book, this book? I don't think that's really necessarily our role. However, I think I would say, speaking for me and a lot of members of our caucus, I don't think that things that borderline, if not our pornography, should just be distributed to sex second and third graders. So if school boards, you know, want to have that conversation, how we can make sure that at the local level they can have that level of input and control the, um, uh, to have, you know, to make sure those materials aren't being distributed, then that is a, a role in which I think the legislature should engage. But I think you're seeing more and more, and, and again, parental rights. I think that's, you know, parents having involvement really is where it boils down to in my mind. And as we're making these decisions, what does the, how does that impact the parents with their students? So if or their children, I should say, not their students. If I'm hearing you correctly, you do think that perhaps making it illegal to possess and distribute these books is on the docket this year? Well, I wouldn't necessarily say that there's a bill that will do that. However, what I would say is I think Iowans that I talk to and Iowans across the state think it, that, that age-appropriate material should be distributed to the obviously the proper age in which the group is. Like I said, if you have early elementary students seeing certain things that we would probably classify as pornography, uh, that you know the school board should have the ability to be able to take action against that. But as far as a broad bill that just says, hey, we're going to make a list of five books that say we can't teach, I think that's very difficult for the legislature to, to get into that level of the weeds. But I also don't think we can turn our back on that issue either. And to be fair, I don't believe it's second and third graders who are seeing these kind of books. They're 17 year old parents who are parents of 17 year olds who are having issue with it. And that, and that may be what, whatever the age is. The point of it is, is it's still something that um, if, if it's an issue that we're hearing from the parents, a, a perfect example, go back to last year. What, the first bill the legislature took action on was getting kids uh, back into the school every day. That didn't just come about because the legislature showed up here one day and just said, oh, let's, let's get the kids back. I mean, that was a movement in which it required legislative action to make sure that it happened. Another issue that I've um, heard some rumblings about, um, and I'll just kind of just talk about a couple of these different issues, these social issues that um, are perhaps or not um, on the Republicans in the House mind, um, is uh, legislation to remove sexual orientation and gender identity from the Iowa Civil Rights Code. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I, I cut you off. Sorry. No, please. After you. Yeah, well, I would say from the standpoint of looking at that specifically as far as an issue, I think that's fairly dangerous for us to go down the path and just start 
pulling things out of the Civil Rights Code. That being said, I know there's other issues that, you know, and, and I'll, I, don't know if it's, I don't know if it's on your list or not to ask, but you look at uh, uh, transgender athletes competing in sports. I spend, like I told you earlier, I spend every Saturday of my life sitting in a gymnasium and have two daughters that play uh, at a fairly uh, high level at our in our school district. And so from that standpoint, if there's issues like that, that as a legislature, we need to look at and make decisions on, I think that that's a, uh, an appropriate use of our time. But I think when you start going into the specifics and saying, hey, we're just gonna start stripping broad pieces from the Civil Rights Code, I think there is some danger in doing that. But you do support banning transgender athletes from I think. I think if we're going to have that conversation as a legislature, um, I think protecting women's sports is a huge thing I hear about. Like I said, every Saturday, every, every what is it, Tuesday, Friday, uh, I'm in the gyms watching girls basketball right now. Um, and so that's an issue that we hear a lot about. What I would say, if we're going to go down that path of addressing the issue, it has to be something that's workable for our boys and girls associations. I mean, you can't just say, well, here's a piece of legislation figured out. So there would be some complications in doing that. But I think as a legislature, if we're gonna have that conversation, uh, I would be open to that. But the broader uh, topic that you asked specifically, I think that isn't, that isn't the right path and to address some of these issues. We also spoke to the Senate majority leader about that issue, Jack Whitford, and his interview is at weareiowa.com. He has a bit of a different take. Uh, we'll have more with Jennifer Kahn first after the break, including how to be effective while serving in the minority. You're watching This Week in Iowa. So you heard my conversation with Speaker of the House, Pat Grassley, about some of those more controversial issues that might come up this legislative session. Well, I brought those to the attention of Jennifer Kahn first to hear her reaction. Take a listen to our conversation. Changes to the Iowa Civil Rights Code, those changes being removing sexual orientation and gender identity from being protected under the Iowa Civil Rights Code. Uh, what's your reaction to knowing that could be on the table for this next legislative session? What are we doing? Why are we doing this? Why are we not addressing issues like workforce, the economy, jobs, wages, the things that Iowans ask us to come here to do? Why are we finding ways to legalize discrimination, to target individual people in the state of Iowa and make them feel less welcome? What are we doing? Where are our priorities? Our priorities need to be on making sure that Iowans can live the best lives they want, can have the jobs they want, and live in an economy that's thriving. That's what we're here to do. The rest of this is just appealing to the base, and it's a cynical attempt to try to get votes from people and try to fire up the culture wars in a way that is really hurtful and damaging to people. You also mentioned education. Um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about it, education has gotten divisive. I mean, if it already wasn't, it has gotten to the point where it is just filled with rhetoric, um, hateful rhetoric. Do you believe that parents should have more of a say in the education their children are receiving from a public institution? I think of course parents should have a say in how their school is run, how their school districts are run, and that, that really comes down to who they decide to vote for for school board and how those school boards do their work. But I also believe that I am not an eighth grade teacher. I didn't go to school for four years or six years to learn how to be an eighth grade teacher. And that's why I send my kids to school so they can learn from people who are experts in the field and who know what's best, not just for kids, but how to teach them. And so I think that we are really shortchanging our teachers here when we remember that these people are educated and experts in these areas and that the whole purpose of education is to expand your mind and broaden your mind and develop critical thinking skills. By, by interjecting ourselves too often as parents into these conversations, I think that we're, we, we need to remember that we're not just affecting our child's learning, but other children's ability to learn. And that's not right. Our job is to raise our children. And then when they go to school, they learn as part of a community because that's how the world works. It's critically important to me that critical thinking stays an outcome of public education because I know when I'm hearing, you wanna talk about workforce, when I'm hearing from people who are hiring for jobs, it used to be they would say, find me someone who can write. That's the most important thing. Now they tell me, find someone who can think critically and think independently and can change their mind. These are the things that employers want because that's what good professionals are, people who continue to learn and grow. If we're not starting that in our schools, we got a lot of catch up to do when they get to the workforce and that's not what employers need. So this is even a workforce issue right here. There's another um, divisive issue that could perhaps be brought up in legislation. Obviously, we 
haven't seen it yet, but um, legislation to make it illegal to possess or distribute controversial books. These controversial books have become just such a hot button topic at school board meetings across the metro, across the state. Um, what is your reaction to knowing that there could be legislation to make it illegal to possess or distribute those books? I am um, not often speechless, but when I first heard about this, I was speechless. I can't believe we're still having these conversations and having them in a way that, again, is a cynical ploy to win a culture war when all the information isn't out there. There's a ton of misinformation out there that people are spreading around to make it seem that things are worse than they are. And finally, it is taking away the opportunity for teachers and students to have really good, thoughtful conversations in the classroom, which is what teachers are supposed to do is guide students through learning, growing, expanding their beliefs. I'm not talking about these individual books. I'm talking about the slippery slope that it starts. If we start banning books now and we start saying it's going to be a felony to own or distribute a book when you're a teacher, first of all, pause and think about that sentence. And second of all, what is next? What book is next? What if someone decides that we don't like the way math is being taught in schools? I know that when my kids came home with math homework, I didn't understand it. I didn't say quit teaching it this way because I know better. I learned how to help my kids with their math. That's what schools do is they challenge and push and teach kids. And to imagine a world in which we're banning books is really the start of something I don't think we want to get into. We have a whole lot more with Jennifer Converse counterpart in the Senate. Senator Zach Wall is the minority leader at WeAreIowa.com, as well as the full interview with Jack Whitfer, the Senate Majority Leader. Again, WeAreIowa.com. You're watching This Week in Iowa, and we'll be right back. Thank you so much for being here for This Week in Iowa. Don't forget, tomorrow is the first day of the 2022 legislative session. And next week, we will have a full recap. We'll hear from the governor in her condition of the state, as well hear from, once again, the majority and minority leaders in both the House and the Senate. And if you missed anything this week or you ever missed This Week in Iowa, we have a podcast. Just search This Week in Iowa wherever you find your podcasts. Have a great rest of your weekend, everyone, and we'll see you back here again next week.